Um, uh, why don't we go to our next guest, which is Dorothy Gasquet. Welcome, Dorothy. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. We first met uh, a week before last at the uh, at the Working Families Christmas Gala, which was a very interesting event. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and at the event, you we were telling me about some of the interesting things going on. So why don't we start with uh, the your involvement with uh, politics and and where you live and and what you're running for. So let's let's give us give us the fascinating background behind you. All right. Well, um, so I've been a political activist for several years, um, but I started organizing when Bernie Sanders announced in 2015 and became the lead grassroots organizer in Southwest Washington for his campaign, and then from there. Um, and trying to keep this momentum of this political revolution going, I jumped into the race to run for Congress in 2018 to represent Southwest Washington. And you're, uh, you had some interesting stats um, on uh, how many, on the percentage of votes that, that Bernie got in the primary. But it's the caucus, we caucus. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we took the, we took the third congressional district with 80.8% .8 of the vote. That's standard. That's one of the highest. I actually attended one of the caucus meetings over uh, in Longview, and because I'd never, I'd never experienced the caucus system, and I wanted to see how it worked. And uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty funny because they would break up into the groups, and then people would would talk for their candidates, and uh, and so they would go around the circle and. The first one to talk about Bernie, and the second one to talk about Bernie, and the third one to talk about Bernie, and then the fourth one to talk about Bernie, and then we finally came across. No, someone said, "So, is there anyone here that's supporting Hillary?" And this this one poor delegate or caucus member said, I "I'm supporting Hillary, but I feel like I brought a knife to a gunfight." <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, you know it was uh, it was astonishing to see the overwhelming support for Bernie Sanders. Um, uh, it was even greater than it was here in Portland. Yeah, in a lot of places, we even doubled caucus turnout over the 2008 record. So we we brought a whole lot of people into the process who had never participated before. It was pretty amazing. That was, that was what was so exciting about being there because it was clearly uh, a lot of new energy, and it wasn't the you know the the party stalwarts who have been doing this for decades, but people were actually getting involved and coming out, which was uh, one of the huge benefits we saw of the Sanders campaign. Yes. So uh, you have an opponent in this election. Well, I have lots of opponents in this election. <laughs> but, um, I mean, we're an open primary, so everyone will be on the same ballot, regardless of party affiliation. Um, so even the incumbent has to run against all of us in the primary. Oh, is it a top two? Yes, top two. So, so you have an open primary. Uh, you've got... Uh, numerous opponents, and then in the fall, the top two will have a, a runoff. Yes. So, interesting. <laughs> um, and so you have your incumbent, who apparently who probably is running again, and then then you have Democrats running against you as well. Yes. How many How many Democrats do you have running against you? So there's four of us total. Um, there's... Two apparent front runners, I guess, on the Democratic side. Um, the the newest candidate um, who jumped into the race, the entire political establishment is getting behind her and trying to pressure everyone else to get behind her. Um, but we've been extremely successful in building our campaign here. We have more than 120 identified volunteers and more than 1,600 donors. But the establishment keeps trying to tell people we're non-viable when we've been the front runner for months. Um, it's actually rather insulting. What did you do to piss them off? <laughs> I, uh, I organized the political revolution. And so we've replaced a lot of people in the party. Um, and they bullied a lot of people that we brought in, a lot of young people we brought in. They bullied them out of the party. Um, so here at our local county meetings, like, I don't even like to walk into that room. It's not a fun place to be. But when I go to meetings outside of the county, because we have seven counties in this district. So when I go to meetings outside of Clark County, 
it's a whole different attitude. People are welcoming and nice and it's great and I love it. But here in Clark County, they just cannot let go. That's very interesting. So uh, you're, you're, the, the newest candidate you referred to uh, uh, moved to the county from um, from Oregon. So one of ours is up and, and is now an opponent of you, which I think is very interesting. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's it's a big mistake to put all their power behind somebody who's, I mean, essentially carpetbagging. You know, she doesn't, while she has connections to the political establishment, she's not known in the community in general because she's not here, you know, volunteering at our nonprofits and organizing in our community. She, she just works here. And I just, it seems weird to me. I wouldn't think if I worked, if I crossed the river and worked in Portland, I wouldn't think that I should go and run for office in Portland. And uh, what, what's most curious is how she surfaced to be the establishment candidate, because I, I've been involved in the Democratic Party of Oregon for 21 years or so, and I'm not familiar with her. So she's not been around this group. So I don't think the Democratic Party of Oregon exported one of our people, and especially when we are searching desperately for candidates to run for seats down here. Um, there's there's a very interesting story in there, which I wish someone would find out on how she showed up to to be uh, a candidate in their race. Yeah, well, it, it looks like she made the decision herself. And she's been, she's been active in things here locally on the political side. Um, oddly enough, uh, Someone had mentioned one of the other candidates in the race had mentioned serving on our port, the Port of Vancouver Citizens Advisory Board with her. And the first thing that came to my mind was, wait, you don't actually have to be a citizen to sit on the advisory board. <laughs> it just, it's, it's such a, it's just the whole thing just seems so weird to me. And you know, I just, but the, just the part where they're just completely disrespect disrespecting the grassroots and the grassroots energy that we have brought to the party by telling people we're non-viable and not ever even having sat down and asked me, you know, what was happening in the campaign, what we were doing and what kind of voter contact we were going to be able to achieve. They never asked any of those questions. All they're doing is looking at an FEC report. So they're not seeing the volunteer energy and they're not going to see all those small donations because they're not itemized. Uh, yeah, it must drive them crazy because they're so used to scouring the contribution forms and finding out who the big dogs are and uh, and then going after their money. And I know if you look at, at our contributions to the Progressive Oregon organization, 99% of them are well under a hundred dollars. So no one's names are listed, um, but I enter all, all their names into the system in case they ever go over the hundred dollar limit and uh, we, we keep it legal. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's been fascinating talking to Washington because, uh, you know, we were, I always thought that our problems here in Oregon were unique. And then we find out that the problems that you're having with Washington party is very similar to the ones that we're experiencing here in the Democratic Party of Oregon. Yeah, I think it's a it's a national problem. It's a lot. It's it's this whole level of elitism, and it's really starting to become very frustrating, very insulting. Like, I'm a combat veteran. I and not just like just like any kind of combat veteran. Like, I was a non commissioned officer. I led combat patrols, and you know, manage like base security. And so I have leadership experience and battle tested leadership experience on top of that, of being a very successful grassroots organizer. I mean, building this movement here in Southwest Washington that got Bernie 80.8% of the vote. I ran as a national delegate and received the most votes out of anybody. And so I have this success story, but they they don't want to acknowledge that. But when I'm out campaigning and if I'm talking to Republicans, I don't get that same disrespect. If I tell them I'm a combat veteran, then immediately their attitude changes and they're willing to have that conversation with me. 
as opposed to the Democratic Party leadership, which is very dismissive. Like they, I don't know what exactly they expect to do in this blue collar district, you know, trying to run someone who with, you know, fancy college degrees, but no real work experience, like labor experience. The messaging is also very strange because if there was anything that I got out of what happened last year was that there are people who feel that the Democratic Party is not paying attention to their issues. And, you know, we, we, we listen to the Democrats in Congress go to negotiate over the budget and, you know, their, their number one issue is the Dreamers, which is very, very important, but that just illustrates that they're missing the core issues that are facing Americans and keeping us back from from achieving the the just your basic uh, lifestyle that we come to expect here in our country. Yeah, I mean that's. I mean, we have the worst income inequality that we've seen since the Great Depression, and we have this problem that's been known for an entire generation. I mean, in 1991, when Bill Clinton announced that he was going to run for president, he talked about the next generation go coming into adulthood worse off than their parents. You know, this is what I grew up hearing. And, you know, then living that reality of having to work harder just to be at the same level that my parents were at this age. Uh, and seeing my son now, who's 16, and, you know, he's getting ready to head off to college, and he's... He's looking at all these college pamphlets that they're sending him and all the emails they're sending him and thinking about how, like, how am I going to afford to pay for this? And on top of that, like, he knows that it's not going to be just him going and getting a bachelor's degree. Like, he's got to go to school longer to just achieve the same level of success that we have, which is less than what our parents had. So two generations now, two generations, and none of the problems have been fixed. It, all we're left with every election is, would you like things to be a little bit worse or a lot worse? <laughs> and I want better. Like I want to, to hear, I want to make that to, someone to say, hey, would you like things to be better? So I can say, yes, yes, I would love things to be better. 